Welcome to the AICPA Town Hall Series, your resource for the latest news and updates on pressing issues facing the accounting profession. Good afternoon and welcome to the AICPA Town Hall. I'm Eric Auskerson, one of your hosts for today. I'm with Rachel Dressen, who's the Director of Congressional and Political Affairs at the AICPA, and Lisa Simpson. Lisa, it's great to be with you. Thanks, Eric. Good to be here. Wish I was with you in New York. Yeah, we, 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 we wish you were here in New York as well. So we've got a great show planned for you. Uh, we'll be covering a lot of breaking news. And, and Lisa, one thing you and I were just talking about is today is February 2nd. It's Groundhog Day. So I'm sure many of you have heard that Puxitani Phil saw his shadow. Uh, so we've got six more weeks for winter. And here in the town hall, sometimes uh, we it does feel like Groundhog Day because we're, we're talking about issues again and again. Uh, but that's that's just how many things work in the, in the D.C. arena. So we're going to start things off uh, and get a D.C. and profession update uh, from Rachel. We're going to kick it off talking about a tax topic that I know is top of mind for many of you, uh, the R&D uh, Section 174 issue. Then Lisa's going to go into some technical updates. And then we're going to have a deep dive on some accounting and audit hop, talk, hop topics. And we've got some special guests that will be joining us for those sections. So here's the lineup. But let's kick things off uh, with uh, the DC discussion. So Rachel, again, welcome. It's great to have you uh, with us. Just a little bit of additional background on Rachel. Rachel's been with the AICPA for a number of years. But prior to joining the AICPA, you supported a number of uh, representatives in the House, uh, and the last one being Cong Congressman Ron DeSantis, who's now Governor DeSantis. That's right. It's great to be here. Thank you for having me. So the issue we're going to start off with is an issue that we received a lot of questions on uh, during the last town hall, and this is related to... Section 174, the R&D credit, uh, which in the 2017 Tax Act, um, it was stated that in 2022, you were not going to be able to fully deduct this, Lisa. So we've got a lot of resources that I know that your team is working on. But Rachel, why don't you first tell us, you know, where we're at and what happened at the end of last year and what is going, what is going on right now related to this matter? Well, this is a really important issue. It's one that we've been hearing from a lot of people about. It's an issue that we've been advocating aggressively on. And at the end of last year, when they were debating the Omnibus Appropriations Act, this was being considered as part of the whole tax extenders mm -hmm. package. But the issue is, is that it was attached to the enhanced child tax credit. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they weren't able to come to an agreement and they weren't able to include this in the omnibus bill that ultimately passed Congress, even though there was tre tremendous bipartisan support. And there continues to be tremendous bipartisan support on this. And in fact, just earlier this week, the new House Ways and Means Committee Chairman, uh, Chairman Smith, he indicated support for this. But where we are right now is that it's finding a vehicle or a bill that is moving that this language could then get attached to. And because we don't expect there to be a lot of large tax bills, this Congress is trying to find something that this language could be included and then get signed into law. Well, I mean, and it, it's 2023 now. So we're, we're in the 2022 uh, tax filing season, Lisa. If you, if you Google this matter, you'll see all kinds of updates from a number of firms. I know you're talking to a lot of firms about this. Why don't you share some of the resources and some of the things that we're doing to help the practitioners address this matter? Thanks, Eric. Yes, I'm hearing from practitioners um, at, via email. If I'm talking to them in person, they're, they're immediately bringing up Section 174 and um, some of the pain that it's causing to their clients. There's a lot of um, uncertainty about what to do, how to handle the communication with your client. Some firms are saying, let's extend, go ahead and make the estimated payments. But um, do we extend and wait to see if um, the vehicle that, that Rachel was talking about actually 
comes to pass and we do get um, to go back to pre-TCJA. Um, so what we're going to do is our tax section is hosting a call on February 9th, so next Thursday at 3 o'clock. Sound familiar? Um, and we're going to bring in a couple of practitioners who are living this 174 circumstance every day with their clients. And they're going to talk about what they're doing in their practice. It's a free session, and it's just a good chance to connect with your peers and hear from them about what they're doing. But what we're also going to do on the next town hall, Chris Wittich, who, if you're on Twitter, you might know him as Ravenous Tiger, is going to come on and um, take a deeper dive into the topic with me. And um, then we will be having him on February 16th town hall. We'll share those insights and um, hopefully take some of your questions. In the meantime, uh, we do have that, a really good tax advisor outline, um, a tax advisor article that's going to outline the provisions. And Eric, as Eric said, if you uh, if you Google Section 174, you're going to get a lot of good um, content to read. Well, there's a lot of questions coming in uh, to uh, related to practical tips on how to deal with this. So this is what we will be talking about on February 16th, and you've got that February 9th webcast. So one last question, Rachel, for you. There's a lot of energy here in the town hall community on, you know, what can they do to assist? So maybe a, you know, expand a little bit more on how the AICPA is going to continue to advance their advocacy efforts. So right now we are looking for any and every opportunity to get this passed. So we are, as we mentioned, looking for a vehicle. So once we identify an opportunity to get this language included in moving legislation, we will notify you all, will notify you on this town hall about opportunities to then reach out to your members of Congress, members of the Senate to advocate in support of getting this legislation passed. Well, thank you. Thanks, Lisa. You'll be back with us uh, momentarily. But let's now uh, pivot. Uh, there's a lot of lot going on uh, related to organizing committees and setting agendas related to the IRS. And we're still waiting for uh, the, the, the nominee's approval. That's right. So over the past couple of weeks in Congress, they've been organizing their committees, which means that they're determining which members will sit on each committee. And now that that is nearly finished, they are now in the process of starting to implement their agendas. And looking at just the tax writing committees, first the Senate Finance Committee, the chairman of that committee is Senator Wyden. One of his priority issues is to get Danny Warfel confirmed as the next IRS Commissioner. Danny Warfel is doing a lot of the work right now behind the scenes in meeting with senators on the Finance Committee. So once they are ready and able to do so to have that confirmation hearing, he will be ready to go. And so that's something that we expect to have to see being announced very, very soon. And as well as seeing the National Taxpayer Advocate up on the Hill. And in the House Ways and Means Committee, the new chairman of that committee, Chairman Smith, has released what he is calling the Agenda for Working Families, and that includes things related to jobs, increasing wages, and investment in America. But something else that he has done in the past couple of weeks is he has established a whistleblower line in which IRS employees can go online and report any uh, wrongdoing that they see going on at the IRS. And that is something that we expect that will be part of the oversight hearings that he will be having over the next few months and this year. And then just really quickly moving over to a couple of other committees that have jurisdiction over issues that the profession follows in the Senate Banking Committee the chairman, uh, Sherrod Brown, he has said that he plans to focus on issues related to digital assets, housing, and climate change. And then lastly, over in the House, in the House Financial Services Committee, Patrick McHenry, who is the chair of that committee, has announced that his first hearing will be on an issue related to China, but he also plans to focus the committee's work on digital assets, capital formation, and data privacy. So full agenda there, and we're, it looks likely that uh, 
nominee Danny Werfel is going to be confirmed by, since the Senate is still in control by the Democrats? Yeah, the, since the Senate is a 51-49 with the Democrats in the majority, unless something comes out mm -hmm. in his confirmation hearing, I think it's probably likely that he will get confirmed. I know that he's anxious to get there just to, you know, we've started a new tax season, mm -hmm. but also to implement the money that was appropriated to the IRS as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. Well, moving on to another uh, hot topic, um, Biden-McCarthy, a lot, a lot of news yesterday related to their meeting about our $31 trillion <laughs> uh, uh, debt and, and, and the limit that's going to have to be increased. Yes. So this was the that was the big news yeah. this week was that meeting. There were no breakthroughs out of that meeting, but no one expected there to be any. Um, it's been described by some as the first steps in a long dance, as the initial touching of the gloves or a first date. However you want to look at it, it was the first time that the president and the speaker have met since uh, McCarthy is now speaker. And we expect that these negotiations will be ongoing and you know they consider what is um, x date which is when the government could then um, default will be likely sometime in june although it's a moving target it depends on revenues coming in but they, these negotiations will continue uh, likely up until then the president has been pretty insistent mm -hmm. that he wants a clean debt ceiling but Republicans are saying that they want spending cuts attached to any debt limit increase. And in fact, last week, 24 Republican senators sent a letter to the president mm. saying that there must be structural spending changes in order for them to vote for an increase of the debt ceiling. So there's some talk about potentially pushing this to sep September 30th, just to give more time for those negotiations to take place? Yep. So they are discussing right now whether or not they should delay um, the debt limit until September 30th, which would tie it to the government funding the fiscal year. Mm -hmm. And so that would also put some more pressure on them to come up with a deal. It's not clear right now whether or not they would have the votes to delay it until September 30th, but it is something that is being considered. And so we'll have to wait and see whether or not they're able to do that or if it's even in consideration, depending on how the negotiations go. Well, this is something that we're going to continue to talk about, Rachel. I know there's a lot of uh, activities uh, underway with the advocacy team related to making sure that this, this is a top of mind issue. And this is something that Mark Peterson talked about on the last town hall. And we may have a special session where we just you know, dig into the whole issue a little bit deeper. So thank you, Rachel, for today's update. We'll have you back uh, for the open forum section. Now I'd like to uh, bring Lisa back on uh, to cover technical updates. Uh, you've got a lot of information ahead of you here, Lisa. Yeah, we got some some tax talk and then we've got some a and talk. So it's going to be a, a, a great little segment. And then Eric, I'll see you back at open forum. All right. So first, I wanted to bring you up to speed on some new IRS guidance around that digital assets question that changed substantially on the front page of, of the Form 1040. If you remember, well, we've been talking about this for a little while. The, um, the wording on the question changed from in 2021. It was, did you receive, sell, exchange, or otherwise dispose of financial interest in any virtual currency? Then the 22 draft form came out and the question was changed. At any time during 2022, did you receive as a reward, award, or payment for property or services, or sell, exchange, gift, or otherwise dispose of a digital asset or financial interest in a digital asset? And our teams have been advocating with the IRS for quite some time to add some clarity and definition around that question because it was just so substantially different than the prior year. So just last week on the 24th, we got um, some IRS information that really um, does provide some clarity and in, in some additional direction. And in addition, it reminds all taxpayers to answer the question, regardless of whether there were transactions involving digital assets, 
and a friendly reminder, report all, all your digital asset income. Um, they did one of the things that we had been asking about. Um, we're still looking for clarity on what is a digital asset versus, versus a virtual currency. And they provided some examples of that. Um, it goes into some information about when to check yes and when to check no on that question. It gets pretty detailed, but um, we've, we've got some resources for you on the next slide that link you to a Journal of Accountancy article that you can review to um, help dig in a little bit. And so that'll give you the information on when to check yes, when to check no. What we're happy about is that this gives us some, some substantial authority around the topic, but our task force still sees that there are some, some open questions that we need. Um, if we could slip, flip to the next slide for me, uh, there we go. Um, so you've got a, a good resource that uh, we're creating a library around these topics. And um, we're also asking for additional information that I mentioned in some comment letters, still working on more of those. They did come out, the IRS did come out with some information on crypto losses and um, donating crypto. But again, we still need some clarity around how to actually report those on the return, where do they go and things like that. Um, the next topic that I wanted to talk about is K2, K3, speaking of Groundhog Day. Um, I've been listening to this podcast that the tax section put out, our tax section Odyssey podcast, uh, called Uncovering the In Intricacies of K2, K3. I've listened to it twice, and I got just got to tell you, it's, it's really good. It's got a lot of great intel that you just can't convey in a, in a JVA article or anything like that. So I really encourage you to download that podcast and give it a listen. Here's just a brief look at some of the topics. Um, who's actually eligible for that domestic filing exception that we've all been talking about for quite some time? It looks at the two prong test, um, what no or limited foreign activity income actually means, how to report foreign source income if you do have it. Um, it talks about the requirement that the partners be U.S. citizens or resident aliens and gets into a lot of other details that, again, I think are going to be really important for you to take a listen to. And then just as a reminder, we have our K2, K3 library where you'll find things like um, sample notification. I'm getting a lot of questions about that, so make sure that you look at the K2, K3 library. Another hot topic, and it ties into another tax section Odyssey podcast, is around the pass-through entity tax. As a reminder, um, back in 2017, as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, um, state income tax for individuals was limited to $10,000 um, income and property tax. So this idea of the pass-through entity tax came about. And it, a lot of uh, research has been done about it. Tax, uh, states are getting involved and it's just gotten really complex. So April Walker, again, had a great conversation with a presenter from our national tax conference and walks you through a lot of the complications and things to really consider before you decide with your client what your treatment's going to be on pass or entity tax. So again, it's about 30 minutes and um, great resource. You're going to need to listen to it a couple times too, probably. But uh, I think it's going to be well worth your time to dig into that one. Wanted to remind you that we also have the, the SALT Roadmap and Resource Center and um, a great um, tax advisor article on implications of the pastor entity tax. So those are some of the tax topics that I wanted to make sure we talked about today. But um, because it is approaching um, audit busy season and we're getting into financial statement, year in financial statement, reporting, I thought it would be a good chance for us to talk about accounting and auditing issues. You guys may not know this. I was an auditor early in my career um, for the best years of my life were spent as an auditor. And, and so I'm still a, an audit nerd at, at heart. Um, so to that end, I'm excited to welcome Tom Groskoff. Tom is a director with Barnes and Denning in uh, Cincinnati, and um, he's going to dig into some of these 
accounting tough issues with me. Welcome, Tom. Thanks for joining us on your first town hall. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what you do at the firm? Well, thank you, Lisa, for, for having me. I, I'm in practice. I'm the assurance service line leader for Barnes Denig, which is a regional CPA firm with four offices in, in three states serving you know, many mid-market type companies that I know the town hall audience uh, also serves. Thank you. And sorry about the Bengals. That hurt. Uh, um, <laughs> I was hoping you wouldn't say that. But I know won exactly. last night in a very important game against Providence. <clears throat> but anyway, go ahead. There you go. Okay. Um, so we wanted to start by talking about the, the support that you can have if you're looking at accounting and auditing questions through the AICPA. One is our AICPA technical hotline. This is a free service for AICPA members. They get about 15,000 inquiries a year. And we've got a great team of really experienced CPAs on staff that help that field those calls. So I wanted to start with that. But Tom, you, in addition to your role with Barnes Denig, you also have a really important role with the Center for Plain English Accounting. Can, we've had Bob Durek on um, a couple of sessions, but can you remind our audience what CPEA is and then yeah, talk sure. a little bit about it? Sure, I'd be happy to. So I'm the technical director for CPEA. It's about half of my my time. And you know, CPEA was, was really the vision of the, the late Dr. Tom Radcliffe, along with Chuck Landis, to provide national office type resources to the 30,000 or, or so CPA firms that, that don't have that, including my own. And, and that takes the form of, of written answers to questions, to trainings, to webcast to at least three monthly reports on on a and a topics that that are really geared towards private companies uh, there's a variety of other resources that are out there but many of them are not geared towards private companies that is our mantra one of my favorite things about the cpea is that it really is plain english and you guys work really hard to give great examples in your reports I put an example of one of them on the screen um, because we know that a lot of for-profits have gotten pandemic funding for the first time and might not know what to do about it. So this is one of the, the many timely relevant topics that um, Center for Plain English reports on. So through CPEA and through the technical hotline, we get a lot of insight into what some of the top challenges are or some of the questions that that firms are asking about accounting issues. And I think we've got a list of those. Um, so we, I know that least standard is, is on the top of the list on that, um, on our list here, but you've got several others. So let's, let's hold off on least standards. We're going to get to that, but what else are you hearing? Yeah. So I'll just build on some of the things that I know have been well chronicled in, in this uh, forum, the employer retention tax credit. And I'm not a tax guru, but financial reporting of aggressive ERTC eligibility claims you know, is a topic that we have been covering extensively and how those need to be evaluated through the accounting policy that was selected for that. And, and perhaps uh, reevaluated, and, and while the focus is not from our perspective in, in CPEA whether or not an entity pays those ERTC claims back to the government, it's whether or not they should be shown as a liability on their financial statements. So we've had extensive resources on that. We also get a lot of questions about whether or not there should be a quote restatement of prior financial statements because of a ERTC position that has been. Uh, re-evaluated or evaluated for the first time. And you know, generally that would not be the case. It would not be an error in previously issued financial reporting for the, the failure to claim what is a voluntary tax credit. I mean, think about it. You'd have to do an exhaustive catalog of all the credits that may be available to you and make a yes, no decision. Financial reporting does not require that. You know, so if you client does determine that at some later period that they want to take that credit, uh, it generally would be accounted for prospectively. And then finally, just to build on a couple other things on the uh, uh, salt workaround regimes that uh, Lisa mentioned earlier, from a financial reporting perspective, you, how do you treat that? Is that an equity transaction or does that go through 
the income statement and those payments can be significant so we've been we've taken positions on that and while there are a lot of different nuances generally speaking the attribution of those salt workaround regimes for financial reporting is with the owner and should be accounted for through equity which is different than how it is treated on the tax side now that would obviously not apply to immaterial payments but that would be something to note and then finally the environment is much different these days with interest rates and, and inflation and that can give rise to financial reporting issues dealing with impairment of goodwill or other long life assets because the discount rate has gone up because it's built on treasury rates which have gone up dramatically thereby reducing the present value of cash flows that gets compared to a goodwill reporting unit or a long lived asset group. So you see more impairment questions. Uh, the interest rate environment has also given rise to questions about debt modifications. And as Jen will talk about later on, a uh, going concern. So I think that kind of summarizes the non-lease uh, hot topics we've been seeing, Lisa. And I was really intrigued when um, Bob brought up the idea of, of the economic impact of rising interest rates and inflation on financial reporting. So we have um, made available to our attendees today a resource that um, CPEA has put together. So important reminder, download the slides, that's step number one. And then step number two is go to that resource section of the, the conference platform and make sure that you grab those CPEA reports. We've got three of them in there. One of them, again, is about the economic impact of rising interest rates and inflation. So pretty, pretty interesting stuff. Um, okay, we promised we would spend some time talking about the new lease standard. So, Tom, you got a lot of things on this list of considerations about implementing the lease standard. Which one do you want to talk about? And I won't let me limit you to one. What What do you want to talk about? I'll cover a few of them. And then if I have time, I'll, I'll circle back. I'm sure okay. there's a lot of questions on it. But I probably should start with one that's not on there. And that's the why. And, and I'm guessing you're getting this from some of your gap reporting clients. And it is, I think, important to remind them that this is a long standing inequity in financial reporting that we are attempting to iron out, uh, whereby in the past, if you had control of an asset through an operating lease, it was not put on the balance sheet. If you have control of an asset through a purchase finance, it is put on the balance sheet. That's an inequity that has been longstanding, well criticized, and we're trying to, to iron that out. But with that brings a lot of collateral consequences, just because the concept of operating leases is so well ingrained in business conduct that trying to uproot it is going to cause collateral consequences. And you see some of those on the slide. I'll cover two of them in particular. Uh, the first is making sure that you have all of your leases categorized as leases. There is a technical definition of a lease. It isn't what the top of the document says, you can make the top of the document say anything. It's based on whether or not you control through a contract or part of a contract, identified property, plant, and equipment in exchange for consideration for a period of time. And if you do, regardless of what the header of the contract says, you have a lease and that needs to be recognized. That likely is more than what many entities have previously treated as leases. And so surveys that we've done and others have found that 60% of entities find more leases, and we call those typically embedded leases colloquially, in their audit preparation that were never disclosed as leases in the past. Uh, I'll cover another one that's on the slide that's of particular interest to this audience, I suspect, and that's on related party leases. So the FASB made a change in the accounting between the old lease standard and codification topic 840 and the new lease standard codification topic 842 with related party leases under common control. In separate financial statements of related parties, those used to be accounted for based on economic substance if the related party relationship significantly affected the terms. And what the FASB thought would be a simplification, they moved to accounting for these based on legally enforceable terms and conditions. 
the problem that they didn't anticipate and have been late in addressing, in my opinion, is that it is difficult to determine what's legally enforceable between related parties under common control that do business very informally, often not in writing. And since they chose to use the legal enforceability concept, it is possible in states, in some states, where you can have legally enforceable arrangements that are not in writing. Implied or oral arrangements can be legally enforceable. So this gave rise to considerable questions and consternation about the need for legal opinions with private company adoption for standard lessee, lessor real estate transactions with private companies. Now, while they have are late to the party because the standard is already effective, was effective 1122 for a calendar year private companies. Now, the FASB does have an exposure draft out that the comment period just expired for on January 16th to try to address this issue where private companies would account and classify leases and identify those leases just based on written terms. Now, this is just for related party leases under common control. And then a follow-on issue, what do you do with leasehold improvements, is also addressed in that exposure draft where they would be amortized over their economic life and would not have that amortization period truncated by a lease term. Now, again, this is just for related party leases under common control. And it is not a final ASU. It is an exposure right. draft. And they do understand the urgency of trying to resolve these questions. So that's a great lead into the resources that, um, that we have on the next slide because CPEA has um, created a report around those common control arrangements. So again, that's another one that you're going to find in the resource section of your um, of, of our slide of our slides today, and um, a couple of other resources. Because I don't know about you, but that sounded really complicated. So what <laughs> we've provided to you is um, again in, in plain English a look at the standard. If you have not um, implemented it or if your clients haven't, haven't implemented it yet, start with that Exploring 84, ASC 842 resource. It is provided by the um, PCPS, and we used um, Galasso Learning and our Technical Issues Committee, which is also focused on private company um, accounting and auditing issues. That's gonna give you a good look at just the basics of, of the lease standard, some of the implementation challenges that Tom just talked about, It'll talk about some of the practical expedient options that are available and, and give you some, some good information there. Some great Journal of Accountancy articles. And then uh, again, I wanna thank CPEA for providing these reports to our audience today. So you got FAQs and then the one on those um, common control arrangements. All right, um, so that was a good look at leases and some of the topics that we're addressing through our technical hotline and CPEA. But um, I always love to plug the FRF for SME option that is about, about um, that is out there for privately held owner managed entities. And um, tax and cash, ba cash basis is also an option if your client does not need gap financials. So we've got a, a good practice aid that will give you some of the, the principles around applying cash or tax basis if you're interested in that. And again, my perpetual shout out um, for FRF for SMEs, which I forgot to spell out um, the financial reporting framework for small and medium enterprises. So uh, a, a good alternative if it meets your needs. Tom, right, did I miss go. anything on that? Yeah, I, I would just add that you know, GAP has gotten to be very expensive, especially lately with the controls that are required, the internal controls for contracts on the revenue side with customers from 606 and controls for vendors now with 842. And that's a very regressive cost for, for many small businesses. So they're finding out as they look at lease accounting software. And so we encourage folks to look at all their options and Lisa outlined some of those to find the most effective and efficient way to communicate financial reporting results to stakeholders. And that may not be U.S. GAAP anymore. Well, Tom okay. and Lisa, we've, we've got a number of questions coming in. This has been uh, uh, 
a very well received uh, session. So this is just related to what you you just discussed. So Tom, they're asking, are you seeing, are we hearing about a lot of private or not for profits electing not to implement the lease accounting standard and are choosing to depart from GAAP and and leverage uh, uh, the some some of the items uh, highlighted here, the FRF. Uh, yeah, anecdotally, yes, we, we've seen that. And it really, you have to break that question down into two buckets. So those that are going to stay on U.S. GAAP but take a GAAP exception or qualification, assuming the effects of not applying 842 are not pervasive, we do see that. Um, and then we see, you know, some that have decided that, you know, the costs involved with GAAP uh, are just too much for the business on a percentage basis, as I said earlier, can be very regressive, very high for, for small businesses. And, you know, most small businesses do not have lawyers on staff and the FASB both in 606 and 842 has leveraged legal enforceability notions that we talked a little bit about that are not just related to related party leases. And, and so some are saying, you know, hey, there are better ways that are more cost effective for us to communicate information to users. But it is important to to, on the front end, educate users about what it is they are getting with an alternative framework. So a quick follow up on that, it, lenders, they got lenders requiring GAP. How do you, how do you manage this? Well, talk to them about it. Uh, talk to them about the cost. Talk to them about, you know, what's involved with the internal controls, the lease accounting software costs, et cetera. But also it's very important to, I think, recast historical financial statements under an alternative framework like FRF SME, and then what was presented in, in U.S. GAAP in the past so that they could see that the differences may not be all that substantial, they usually aren't. Uh, and, and, and the last point on that, users, bankers, sureties do not get the difference between the accounting function and the attest function. You know, so some of the bankers will be like, well, I can't I can't approve this exception to, to use an alternative framework because I need an audit. I have to have an audit and you need to be able to tell them and educate them that you can still do an audit under the tax basis or under FRF SME. But you've got to do that legwork. And the last point I'll make on this, there are some firms out there that are using this as a strategic weapon uh, to, to go after more business because of the costs that are involved with gap, you know, said differently, they are going out and actively marketing their ability to convert clients and educate the users to get them on board and save clients money. And to the point Tom made about educating the lenders, educating um, the, um, shoot, the, the word just escaped me, but recasting financial statements, we have those resources available for you in that um, link under the FRF for SMEs page there. All right. I mean, Lisa, one, I'll just say that, then that a lot of encouragement from the audience here on just the AICPA's activities related to educating the banking community about FRF and, and, and the importance of leveraging this um, for, the right, for the right reasons and the right size clients. Thanks, Eric. All right. So, Tom, I'll see you in open forum. And, um, Eric, I'm going to move on into audit hot topics. So, that's um, I'm going to be joined by... Jen Burns. Jen is our chief auditor. She's been on a town hall before. So welcome back, Jen. And thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Um, I was excited to hear the best part of your career was being an auditor. Yeah. Shh, shh, don't tell anybody. <laughs> All right. Um, so Jen, remind everybody what your role as chief auditor entails. So I'm the chief auditor here at the AICPA and I oversee the development of standards both with the ASB and with ARSC and I work with our audit and attest standards team here at the AICPA. Okay, so I brought you in uh, as I did Tom because we're getting into financial statement busy season and audit busy season and we wanted to talk about some of the economic news that could be impacting um, clients. So you've got economic pressures, you've got inflation, you've got looming inf infl uh, recession, you've got massive layoffs being announced, which are putting pressure on employees who are remaining in a, in a role. And all of that is creating a, an environment where we have to really pay attention to risk of fraud. Um, 
So Jen was kind enough to give us some tips and reminders, and we're going to uh, dig into the fraud triangle. So um, Jen, give us a quick refresher on the fraud triangle and then um, start sharing those tips with us. Yes, happy to, Lisa. And I should say that, you know, with respect to the economy, as auditors, we're required to understand how external factors are impacting the entity we audit. So we need to be thinking about how is inflation impacting the entity? How is it impacting their operating results in business? How is interest rates impacting them? How are changes in the economy impacting them? So that's that's a good reminder as well, Lisa. Um, but then jumping into the fraud triangle, you know, every time we hear about a fraud, this fraud triangle is in play. Um, every time we dissect a fraud, we hear about the three aspects of the triangle. So first with incentives and pressures, um, for example, management is being pressured to meet bond covenants or bonus thresholds or operating losses are creating a threat of bankruptcy or foreclosure, and that's putting enormous pressure on management. And that, that's the top part of the triangle. That, that can lead to fraud being perpetrated. So when those pressures and incentives are present, the fraudster also looks for or has opportunities to commit the fraud. So for example, a fraudster can be aware that there are weak controls or know um, that there are no controls in place. So that gives them the opportunity to perpetrate the fraud. And then the last part of the triangle is about rationalization and attitudes. And the common thing we hear about here from fraudsters is that, you know, they commonly say it was supposed to be a one time occurrence. They were going to steal from the company once and then pay the company back. And that's how they rationalize what they're doing. And so as auditors, it's very important to keep this fraud triangle in mind you know, all the time, but particularly when we're going through a recession or having uh, challenges in the economy. Um, you know, as auditors, we're required to maintain professional skepticism, and it's our responsibility uh, to obtain reasonable assurance that the financial statements are reasonably stated and not materially misstated. And as an auditor, I take pride in that. You know, as a young staff person, I quite frankly, we get excited when I found uh, issues or problems because I felt like I was doing my part to help uh, present, you know, reasonable financial statements and help the client achieve their goal and having accurate and complete financial statements. Yeah. yeah. I remember those days as a young staff accountant. <laughs> um, so you've been looking at data and I think data will be a key theme here and looking at common findings from peer review. So why don't you tell us some of the, the things that you found in your peer review research? Thanks, Lisa. Yes. Um, so first of all, um, one of the common findings is with respect to documenting your fraud brainstorming sessions and your management inquiries. Documentation is a common finding. And so I have to get in a technical reference here, excuse me, Lisa, but AUC 230 paragraph eight, as a reminder, has um, the details about what we need to include in our audit documentation. It talks about the form, content, and extent of your audit documentation. So you might wanna ask your teams to take a look at that just as a refresher. Another reminder is to assess risk at both the financial statement and assertion level. So this includes identifying and assessing risks due to fraud. A common finding in peer review is that we're not assessing risk at the assertion level. So please remember that. And um, we were talking earlier, I, there's a phrase that we had used for uh, a few years around documentation. And it's like, if you didn't document it, then it didn't happen. So again, just stressing the importance of, the, of that documentation in your files. Yes, and a, a plain English explanation is that an experienced auditor not familiar with the audit uh, needs to be able to understand what you did and how you did it. So leave a trail. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. And then you've also been um, doing some, asking for some academic research and, and you've got some great tips out of that research. So catch us up on that. Exactly. I'm very excited about this. So the ASB commissioned some research, and I really have to applaud the research team, which was led by Greg Jenkins, who's an ASB member and a professor at Auburn University. And what they did is they analyzed contemporary audit research to find leading practices regarding the auditor's identification, assessment, and response to fraud risks. And they found some interesting things, which um, I'm, I'm going to show you a few, uh, a few of the tips here. So for example, it's very important 
for leaders of the engagement to set the right tone regarding professional skepticism and fraud. So for example, it's helpful if partners create a supportive environment during the fraud brainstorming sessions, and they can do this by sharing their own experiences and stories uh, regarding fraud, and then encouraging others to share ideas among the team. It's also helpful if staff are rewarded for appropriate skepticism. For example, reward them through positive feedback, even when their investigation doesn't result in identifying an issue or a misstatement. Another tip that was revealed by the research, um, when having discussions with management or others in the entity related to fraud, two auditors in the interview is better than one. Um, and also speaking to management later in the day seems to result in obtaining more information and having a more uh, open conversation. So for me, that says that get them when the coffee has worn off and maybe they're a little bit fuzzy, but I don't know, what's your take on that? Well, just thinking personally, I always have more time in the afternoon to have longer conversations in the morning. I'm worried about responding to emails and getting through my to-do list for the day. So yeah, from a personal perspective, I can understand why talking to management in the afternoon is a better idea. And from a personal perspective, I think it's coffee, but you know, that's okay. <laughs> so one last tip I was gonna mention is that um, we also should be aware that entity personnel may be more likely to commit fraud by omitting transactions rather than falsifying them. And it's important to be aware of this because there might be a tendency to, to think of misstatements of omission as less intentional, but in fact, they can be. So just remember that. Thank you. Um, Jim pointed out a great uh, webcast that we have, audit, audit considerations or consideration of fraud webcasts, and there are multiple um, opportunities to catch that webcast. So you can see what that one's about in, um, in the description there. And you had a couple of other topics that you wanted to uh, make sure that we talked about really quickly as we um, head into open forum. So some additional areas of focus that you wanted to, to call out. So just real quickly, in this economic environment, we might see impacts um, to auditing accounting estimates. So for example, accounts receivable, there might be issues with collectability, goodwill and intangible assets, there might be issues with respect to impairment. So we need to be mindful of that as well in this economic uh, situation. And um, then secondly, with going concern, we're always evaluating the going concern assumption on an annual basis, but in periods of economic recession, there might be additional challenges associated with that. And it's important to remain alert for conditions and events that might raise substantial doubt about the entity's ability to continue as a going concern. And then you also pointed out some good resources around audit evidence, because again, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. So we have a new audit evidence, SAS 142. Exactly. And thank you for bringing that up, because I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't mention that SAS 142 is now effective. And we have a great article out there that you can read that uh, summarizes it for you. Um, so please take a look at that as you're undertaking your audits this year. Thank you um, for all of that education as we head into year in financial reporting and year in audits. And with that, I think we will ask um, Tom, Rachel, and Eric to join us for open forum. Well, thanks, Lisa and uh, Jen. Uh, a lot of a lot of A A A and A questions coming in. Just maybe just Jen a wrap up question uh, for the last uh, session. I mean, are, are we seeing an increase in fraud now over the past couple of years or is this, you know, just what's your thoughts on what you're hearing from firms? I haven't seen any hard data on that, but I mean, we've all heard the headlines. Um, so I think it's important to remain professionally skeptical, um, regardless of what the trends are. It's always a uh, potential for occurrence on the entity you're auditing. Thanks. Well, one topic we didn't cover today, Lisa, even though it is Groundhog Day, maybe we should cover every topic, is ERTC. And the, the question here, maybe for you and Rachel, you know, is, is the IRS shutting down any of these ERTC mills status there? And maybe we want to comment just on some other things that we're hearing about uh, from the firms that you and I spoke about earlier. Um, Rachel, our start. And then if you have anything to add, um, feel free to jump in. We are hearing that um, 
many clients are getting their ERC refunds, even refunds of substantial amounts. In the past, we've talked about um, what we had heard was that the IRS was kind of putting a, a, a slowdown on any refund requests over $100,000, but now we're hearing that those are coming through. I have not heard of any um, shutting down of an ERC a, a aggressive promoter, but you know we, we do understand that it causes some serious friction between you know, your client and you if they're getting bombarded with, um, with messaging that says you're automatic, you're going to get 26,000 per employee. Um, and so we're continuing to talk with the IRS. We got some uh, examples of aggressive marketing just this week that looks like a tax notice. And so we've shared that with the IRS as well, but no concrete action that I can report. Rachel? Yeah, no, I think that's exactly right, that we have heard that um, the IRS is, you know, making these payments, but we haven't heard of any of these that are actually getting shut down. So I think what Lisa said is, is exactly what I've heard of also. Yeah, the marketing seems it's going to continue. We are we are here in this even above a million dollar uh, refunds being provided. So that's people are going to start talking about that. I think in some cases here, we clearly know that these ERC mills are doing things that are not appropriate. In some cases, there, there's there's a few entities that probably are you know un uncovering valid uh, opportunities for clients to take advantage of that of that tax credit. Moving on, Lisa, did you? I, I was just going to say, absolutely. It, it, I mean, it is a complex environment in which to analyze whether or not a, a client really is eligible for ERC. I, I saw a question about how to track down um, shutdown notices and government restrictions. So I'll point you to um, our ERC resource library. There's some great podcasts in there with practitioners talking about how they get their clients to document those shutdown orders. But basically it's, you know, document, document, document. Going back to uh, the leasing discussion. So there is, there's a question here about multi-year software license agreements. Uh, do they need to be accounted for under ASC 842, Tom? Yeah. So this, the definition of a lease is property, plant, and equipment. Generally speaking, software licenses are intangible. Uh, there could be an embedded lease of a server, but just it is important from an audit strategy to think about this as just property, plant, and equipment, and intangibles, which is software, uh, would not be in scope of 842. It would be accounted for by other GAAP. Um, I, I love a, a couple of the, the comments in here. If we think that um, fraud interviews are more effective in the afternoon, then how about the evening? Um, you know, so uh, we'll, we'll go there and give someone a couple glasses of wine and then start asking them about um, their fraud inquiries. So we'll, you know, I'll, I'll leave that up to, uh, to you guys. Um, and can we get a catchier name for FRF for SMEs? I can't believe y'all don't like um, that name. It's so much fun to say. I've heard it called Smurfs and all kinds of other stuff. So we will um, take that under advisement and all recommendations will be accepted. Lisa, there's some questions, clarifying questions related to the engagement letter resource that you were talking about, PCPS, and just where it's at. Maybe you just want to review that again. Uh, did I talk about an engagement letter resource? Hmm. I talked about a lot today, so it's entirely possible. Okay. Well, you know, we, we've got, we've got, we'll, we'll take a look at those questions and as we yeah. always do with the, the follow-up newsletter. So if we can clarify Absolutely. something, we will. Absolutely. Question for you, Jen, related to, you know, just the documentation needed for management's consideration of, of a going concern uh, for the auditor. Well, so management has to do its own assessment first. And so whatever uh, information they have to support their assertion regarding the going concern assumption. So whatever analysis they've done, including forecasts and budgeting, 
Um, it could include various things, but that's important that to say that management has to do their analysis first. Tom, I don't know if you want to jump in here. I'm sure you have a view about this. Um, no, I, I, I agree. I, I would just clarify that there are some financial reporting frameworks that do not require management to make an assessment, but the auditor still needs to consider going concern. <laughs> Exactly. So as the auditor, we then look at management's documentation and, and make our own assessment as well. Well, thanks. I mean, for this this uh, session today on A&A, &A, I think, Tom, you did bring put some things in plain English for the, the town hall audience. We look forward to having you back again uh, and Jen as well. So thank you. And, and Rachel, uh, thanks for being with me here in the uh, New York studio. Lisa and I will now you know, kind of go through some final slides here in, in resources. So once again, uh, here's our in summary uh, information, a lot covered today. Um, leverage this as you, you know, share this with other members of your firm or company or with your clients. Here are the most recent uh, town halls uh, on demand. You can also uh, listen to them via the podcast capabilities. We also have a white paper here um, on firm fintech and, and financing advisory services. This is an area that, that firms are looking to play a, bit, a bigger role in. Um, there's some uh, examples here, some firms talking about how they are supporting uh, just some of the, their clients' financing needs in playing a more active role uh, with fintechs. And this was done uh, with our partner, uh, biz to credit so you, you can download that free white paper as lisa already talked about we are going to have a deeper dive on section 174 so lisa do you want to share any more information related to the discussion that we're planning with with chris next week yeah i'm just i'm really excited to be able to bring you the voice of practitioners multiple practitioners and sharing some of the insights that we get through that um, session that tax section is hoping um, hosting next week and Barry Melanson will be with us once again. So the next two town halls, we've got 9,000, Lisa. We've got 9,000 people with us today. Uh, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are going to continue to bring you a, a lot of uh, tax topics, hot topics, as we work through tax season with you. So the next town hall will be on February 16th, and then we'll have one on March 2nd. So thanks for tuning in today. A lot of great questions. And Lisa, I have to say, the town hall community greatly appreciates all of the technical content you went through today. So thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. It was great to spend Groundhog Day with you. <laughs> thank you for your participation. You can now subscribe to the AICPA Town Hall series on your favorite podcast platform, as well as watch archives on YouTube and AICPA TV. Tune in for live broadcasts Thursdays at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.